coming up, the story of two brothers who lost their father to the gun of a drifter when they were just toddlers. They learned how to make music and they formed a band together as teenagers that would become the stuff of legends. The band they assembled, they're on the verge of a huge national breakout when the eldest brother was killed in a motorcycle accident. Uh, the youngest brother and the other surviving bandmates, they overcame their deep despair, finding the inspiration to carry on within the music of their fallen leader and channeling the ghost of a legend in a song that would become their only pop hit. One of the biggest bands in their genre, the tragedy and triumph surrounding a rock classic is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember trying to create <laughs> a piece of art out of paper mache as a kid, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Click the big red button. Click the bell so you always know when our latest is coming out. We also have a Patreon. You're going to want to check that out. There you'll find more content. You can even become an honorary producer to help us uh, curate this content. I remember trying to create a Darth Vader out of paper mache when I was a kid. <laughs> so fun. So let's jump in the DeLorean and set the circuits to the summer of 1971. Let's go back to the early 70s. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? The Vietnam War was raging, the Pentagon Papers had leaked, and the U.S. NASA program landed on the moon for the fourth time with the crew of Apollo 15. On the rock and roll scene, Jim Morrison of the Doors died from a suspected overdose, and the Southern Rock Boys from Jacksonville, Florida, the Allman Brothers, were about to go from rags to riches. The band was close to succumbing to the slow death of heroin use. Uh, virtually all six members of the Allman Brothers struggle with the highly addictive narcotic and spent time in rehab. The commercial turnaround was the group's third release. It was a live album titled at Fillmore East. When the record hit the stores in July of 71, it immediately generated impressive sales from their royalties received off the sales of this live record. Uh, the band was actually able to pay off uh, all the money that they owed to their manager and then pay back advances from their record label. The newfound prosperity, it rejuvenated the Allman Brothers. The guys started to eat cleaner and they hired doctors to administer daily shots of B12 and then gradually they got back on their feet, healthier and stronger than ever. Dwayne Allman fueled the band's recovery with his passion and his leadership. Uh, his positivity set up the making of the Allman Brothers' next LP, Eat a Peach. To motivate his bandmates, Dwayne repeated a mantra telling the guys, we're on a mission. It's time to make this happen. Now, this meant the continued ascension of the Allman Brothers. Uh, Eat a Peach, it was a two-disc set. One of the discs was live and the other was a uh, disc of studio material that they started to record, uh, I believe, in September of 71. <laughs> The Eat a Peach sessions, they were going really well. And then tragedy struck. October 29th, during the first real holiday, the band was enjoying in more than two years. So Dwayne was visiting the band's communal hangout in Macon, Georgia, dubbed the Big House by the band. Uh, he was giving his birthday wishes to Linda Oakley, the wife of Allman Brothers bassist Barry Oakley. Now around 5.45 p.m., Dwayne hopped on his Harley Davidson Sportster motorcycle and he raced down Macon's uh, Hillcrest Avenue. And not long after that, um, Dwayne attempted to swerve to avoid a pickup truck moving in the same direction. But because of his speed, he didn't see the vehicle in time to make a safe adjustment. The cycle skidded and it flipped over, pinning Dwayne under the truck and dragging him and his bike for a good 50 feet. Dwayne's girlfriend, Dixie Meadows, and Barry Oakley's sister, Candy, they were following the same path as Dwayne. Uh, although they didn't witness exactly what happened, uh, Dixie drove up to the scene in horror of what they did see. Uh, an ambulance was called by a resident that lived nearby with Dixie and Candy praying that Dwayne would survive. Severely wounded from the crash, Dwayne reportedly ceased breathing twice uh, when he was in the ambulance riding to the hospital. Uh, he was revived both times from mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Uh, after three hours of emergency surgery, 
Dwayne Allman was pronounced dead at uh, Macon Medical Center. Now, the attending surgeon, a guy named Dr. Charles Burden, he reported that any of Dwayne's injuries, including a ruptured coronary artery, heavily damaged liver, and a collapsed chest, would likely have caused his death. Uh, but the combination of the injuries would have made Dwayne's fate uh, inevitable. The leader, the driving force, the soul of the Allman Brothers perished. It was a devastating setback for this band. Dwayne was only 24 years old. It was the same age as uh, James Dean was when he died in, in a car crash. In addition to his invaluable role as a founding member of the Allman Brothers, Dwayne Allman was one of the most respected musicians of his entire generation. He's often recognized as the artist that was responsible for the musical revolution in the South. Dwayne and the Allman Brothers were a tremendous influence on the entire region. Actually, a year before his death, Eric Clapton was in the audience of an Allman Brothers concert in Miami, and he was just blown away by Dwayne. The two virtuosos met after the show, and they ended up in an all-night jam session. Uh, that instant rapport between the two of them led to Eric Clapton asking Dwayne to play with his uh, then-band Derek and the Dominoes. Dwayne actually shared co-lead guitar duties with Eric, and he played slide guitar on Layla, of course, one of the greatest rock songs ever recorded. Brothers Dwayne and Greg Allman were only three and two years of age uh, when they faced their first tragic experience. This is when the Allman family was living in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, their father, Willis Allman, he was gunned down in cold blood in a bizarre incident clear back in 1949. Now, Willis was a military man stationed in Norfolk. He was a World War II veteran that was a soldier in the armed forces that stormed the beach of Normandy on D-Day. Uh, of course, the battle that changed the course of the war. The day after Christmas, Willis and a fellow officer, Robert Buchanan, they were on their way to have a few drinks and they picked up a hitchhiker. The two officers befriended the man and took him with them to a little bar hop and, and to play some shuffleboard. At the end of the night, Allman and Buchanan agreed to give the man a ride to a place that he claimed he would be able to sleep for the night. Uh, the man gave him directions on you know, where he wanted to go this led them to a remote area known as Lambert's Farm. When they arrived, the man drew a pistol and ordered both men out of the car. The Virginian Pilot newspaper reported that the man forced Allman and Buchanan to give him their wallets and walk into a dark field. And then he told them to lie down on the ground, face down. According to the article, Allman refused to lay on the ground as directed. He grabbed the gun and he attempted to disarm uh, their captor. In this scuffle, Buchanan actually bolted in the dark and later told the police that he heard two gunshots. The gunman raced off in the car, leaving Allman lying on the ground with a bullet to his chest. Buchanan managed to make it to a friend's home to call the police. And when they arrived to the scene of the crime, they found Willis Allman dead. Uh, the killer was identified as one Robert Buddy Green. Fortunately, he was captured not long after the botched robbery and sentenced to life in prison. And when Dwayne died, the remaining five members of the Allman Brothers, they were just devastated. The band could have just hung it up from there. The fans would have totally understood. But they shook off this deep sadness and they were determined to carry on, you know, just as Dwayne would have wanted them to. During a songwriting session for Eat a Peach, Allman Brothers co-founder Dickie Betts, he created a country-flavored tune that was originally called Ramblin' Countryman. The song was inspired by the late, great Hank Williams. Uh, Hank Williams, of course, a uh, famous country star, died in 1953 from a lethal dose of liquor and pills at only 29 years of age arguably one of the most influential artists in recorded music history. Two years before his untimely death, Hank released Ramblin' Man. It's a song that became a manifesto for Southern boys who related to the narrative of a man with a God-given restless spirit that could not be controlled. I love you, baby, but you gotta understand, when the Lord made me, he made a Ramblin' Man. He made a Ramblin' Man. Dickey revealed that when he was a kid, his dad was a construction worker that constantly moved his family to cities in Florida where he could find work. In the book, Anatomy of a Song, Dickey recalled that he spent a lot of time in the back of a Greyhound bus moving from town to town. Ramblin', as Dickey stated, was just in his blood. Well, 
Fashioned after the restless spirit of Hank Williams, Dickie's tune had a deliberate country flavor to it. He actually never intended it for the Allman Brothers. Instead, he planned to give the song to the man in black himself, Johnny Cash. In Folsom Prison, and time keeps dragging on. The other band members, they were reluctant to record Ramble Man because of his country sound, so it didn't make the cut for you to peach. But when the Allman Brothers were recording the follow-up record, Brothers and Sisters, you know, the LP that came after Dwayne's death, the band, they grew to like Ramble Man. It just so happened to fill an extra slot very nicely to complete this album. The band pulled a 180 on Ramble Man because of Dickie's reworking of a pivotal section in the song's arrangement that changed uh, really the overall complexion of the track. This section was inspired by the breakdown at the end of Layla, you know, that prominently featured Dwayne's guitar genius. It would essentially be a tribute to their fallen leader. <music> to create what Dickie had in mind, though, he first uh, had to do a lot of overdubbing. But he altered his plan. He decided to bring in a guest artist. Actually, Dickie enlisted his friend Les Dudek to play the lead guitar parts with him in a live recording session, just like he would often do with Dwayne in the past. Les performed under intense pressure, though, with a steady death glare from Barry Oakley, who was obviously angry about Dudek uh, standing in the exact spot that Dwayne used to stand in uh, when the band recorded previously. Les and Dickie, they played in unison, laying down an instrumental bed by repeating the guitar line, then repeating the line again in a lower register, which was eventually overdubbed onto the recording. And then Dickie added a slide guitar riff to get a step and repeat blues effect. <laughs> Dickie's brainchild forged a twin guitar harmony that transitioned Ramblin' Man from his five second fiddle emulated uh, intro into a powerful dynamic rocker. I just love it. <music> Accentuating a honky-tonk liberation to Ramble Man was Chuck Lavelle's lively piano riffs. I mean, Lavelle's contribution to Ramble Man was critically significant. His piano parts interchanging with Betts and Dudek's stacked guitar riffs served as a second instrumental soloist on the track. It's very clever. Dickie worked on his masterful arrangement for Ramble Man for over a year, but he actually finished the lyrics in a mere few minutes, sharing that the words came quickly to him because it was really a song about his life and you know, the lives he observed of people around him. Very cool. So after a night of partying at the big house, everyone had gone to bed except for Dickie. At 4 a.m., he was wide awake, and he had this idea for a song. So he just strolled over to the kitchen, and he began to write Ramble Man in one steady stream of consciousness. All done. Man, just amazing. Now, while composing the lyrics for Ramblin' Country Man, later shortened to Ramble Man, of course, uh, Dickie remembers something uh, that a friend had said to him a few years back that became part of the song's hook line. Dickie was bouncing around with a couple of bands in Florida prior to the formation of the Allman Brothers in the late 60s. And he often ran around with his buddy, a guy named Kenny Harwick. Harwick is one of these guys, you know, that would answer his own questions. You know, he'd say something like, how's it going? You're just living the dream, aren't you? So he'd answer it himself. So one day, I guess Harwick asked Dickie how he was doing. And before Dickie could answer, Harwick answered for him. He said, I bet you're trying to make a living and doing the best you can. Well, that quip, Harwick's quip, it was perfect for the second part of the infectious chorus of Ramble Man, and that's where it went. Even with Dickie's stellar overhaul, Ramble Man it was much more rooted in country music than other Allman Brothers tunes, for sure. There was still a little bit of nervousness about the track. When Ramble Man was finished, the band's management and their road crew gathered around to hear it. Now, according to Les Dudek, after the song faded out, the room was eerily quiet. Red Dog, who was one of the band's roadies, he was the first to speak, breaking the silence. And he says, that's the best I've heard since Dwayne. Now, when it came time for Brothers and Sisters, the album to be released, uh, the label for the Allman Brothers, Capricorn Records, they were torn between Wasted Words or Ramble Man to be the lead single from the album. The 
So they decided to take it to a few tastemaker radio stations, you know, and let the listeners make their decision for them. This would be up to the fans. The national promotion director for Capricorn Records sent advanced tapes of Ramble Man to WQXI AM in Atlanta and the East Coast giant WRKO AM in Boston to play the song and solicit phone-in responses from their listeners. At both stations, Ramble Man received a phenomenal reaction. And based on that feedback, Ramble Man was selected as the first single uh, from Brothers and Sisters. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Waste of Words was never released as a single from there. All you really got, yes or no. Meanwhile, Ramble Man, it was a runaway smash. It was actually the only pop hit the Allman Brothers ever had. This single, oh man, it just moved. It rocketed up the top 40 chart and went all the way to number two on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1973. It was actually denied the top spot on the chart by Cher's Half-Breed. Half Cher and the Allman Brothers would share another interesting bit of pop culture history, as many of you probably know. When several years later, uh, Cher and Greg Allman became a romantic couple. They were all over the tabloids. Uh, the couple got hitched in 75, three days after Cher divorced Sonny Bono. And their marriage uh, lasted less than three years. It was quite volatile, primarily because Greg, he couldn't shake his drug habit and he turned into a full-blown junkie from there. But it's very interesting that Greg's future wife and her then husband kept his band out of the number one spot years before. The Allman Brothers didn't have a crossover hit after Ramble Man, but Greg had two hits as a solo artist, uh, a reimagined version of Midnight Rider for his debut solo album, Laid Back. That one peaked at number 19 on the Billboard Hot 174. Oh, and I'm No Angel that stalled at number 49 on the Billboard Hot 100, but it was huge as a number one hit on the uh, Billboard rock charts. Greg's vocal on I'm No Angel reminded many of Bruce Springsteen in that moment. Bring you back some gold. I'm no angel. Greg Allman finally got clean and sober in 1995. However, decades of alcohol and drug abuse took its toll on Greg. He actually needed a liver transplant in 2010, and he passed away at 69 in 2017. Like other extraordinary artists that died before they were 30, you gotta wonder what Dwayne Allman would have done and what the Allman brothers would have done for that matter. You know, if only Dwayne hadn't crashed into the, that truck uh, when he was only 24. Now, for one, Ramblin' Man might not have been recorded at all, or at least not in the way that it became such a Southern rock anthem. Dwayne's death inspired a pretty amazing rock arrangement of Ramble Man. It broke format barriers for AM Top 40 stations in the early 70s, and that's a fact. It's likely, with or without Ramble Man, Dwayne's strong leadership and his visionary artistry would have held the Allman Brothers together for further greatness. You just wonder what other classic songs would have come from this incredible musician. Now, the band rebounded after his death, but they sputtered with inconsistency thereafter. Uh, another key member of the Allman Brothers never really recovered from the tragic death of Dwayne. Uh, I'm speaking of bassist and co-founder Barry Oakley. Uh, when Dwayne died, Barry went into a downward spiral that his bandmates desperately tried to turn around. Barry was visibly suffering from the death of Dwayne, his friend. Uh, he was in a funk of severe depression and would go on binges of drinking and drugs as if he had uh, some kind of a death wish. Greg Allman and Dickie Betts took turns looking after Barry, you know, taking him to places where he couldn't indulge, such as the zoo or just walks in the park. But on November 11, 1972, Barry Oakley suffered a similar fate to Dwayne, uh, his dear friend and mentor. This is when he crashed his motorcycle into the side of a bus, only three blocks away from where Dwayne had been killed in his motorcycle accident. Uh, actually, Barry declined hospital treatment after the crash and ill-advisedly went home. He gradually grew delirious, so his friends took matters into their own hands and rushed him to the hospital. And uh, it was discovered that Barry had a fractured skull from the impact of slamming into that bus. And he actually died shortly after the diagnosis from cerebral swelling. Now, the doctors trying to save Barry's life concluded, though, that even if he would have gone immediately to the hospital for medical care after the accident, as he should have, 
he actually wouldn't have survived. Barry Oakley was buried next to Duane's grave at the Rose Cemetery in Macon, Georgia. He too was only 24 years old when he died. Sadly, Barry's bass work on Ramblin' Man was his last contribution to the music of the Allman Brothers. In 1998, the Georgia State Legislature passed a resolution naming a bridge on U.S. Route 41 in Macon, Georgia, the Raymond Barry Oakley Third Bridge. It's the same Highway 41 that Dickie joyously sang about in the first verse of Ramble Man. Rolling down the highway 41. The same time that the bridge was christened for Barry Oakley, the road that carried the bridge was designated as Dwayne Almond Boulevard in honor and remembrance of the late founding members of the Almond Brothers. I gotta tell you, I was raised on the Southern Rock, a Leonard Skinner, 38 Special, Black Oak, Arkansas, Molly Hatchet, the Almond Brothers, and the like. But Ramblin' Man, it's a song that holds a very special place in my heart. You know, it's auditory ambiance, so magical, so potent. I mean, sometimes it would turn the small town I grew up in of Blackfoot, Idaho, into the South, if only for a few minutes. Rest in power, Dwayne and Greg Allman and Barry Oakley. Your music continues to lift us. And hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about the Allman Brothers and Ramblin' Man. What are your memories of the song of this band? What are the Southern rock songs or bands should we cover here? What do you think about Dwayne Allman as a musician? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe we would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords. <laughs>